their course uh, from Naked Science originally about how the pyramids may have been built and all that. So there, yeah, there's the, of course, the Giza pyramids behind me, of course, on um, this, of course, picture here. But anyway, well, welcome you back. Course History 1113, Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great afternoon, of course, out there. Uh, of course, this week and next week, I am kind of, you know, concentrating on ancient Egypt right now. Uh, of course, today I will be, of course, talking a lot about uh, the pure ancient uh, Egyptian pyramids and how they think they were built uh, and all that. So uh, anyway, uh, looks like we do have a couple students joining us right now. I know in streamer we got Aisha Davis uh, and Daisy and Knight. Uh, yeah, Daisy and Knight watching right now. I don't think we have anybody right now that's really watching uh, on uh, YouTube right now. If anybody else out there, let me know. Of course, of course, later about that. So uh, anyway, um, uh, this week, of course. Um, you know, we did have that one assignment, of course, due this week, of course, which, which was the prehistory quiz, of course, which, by the way, uh, that assignment is going to expire tonight, I think at midnight. So you still got time to kind of wrap that up. Maybe only a few people in this class haven't really wrapped, wrapped that up yet, I saw. Uh, but that does need to be worked on, of course, and you know, wrapped up. Uh, of course, next week, uh, the one, the Simon, I, I gave you a course on ancient Mesopotamia. That's going to be due later in week, next week. Of course, that may, you know, I don't know. We'll see. We got this hurricane coming toward us. Looks like it, uh, Hurricane Ida. So we're going to Louisiana here. We're going to see how that kind of pans out for us. And, of course, that might throw off our whole lecture series, of course, uh, coming up next week. Uh, but you did have a, a vocab that's coming up, of course. First key terms assignment due also next week. So I kind of want to give you a heads up on that. Uh, of course, some of these assignments, like I said, might be, you know, pushed back, of course, because of what's going on with the tropical weather around here. Because that's, you know, Louisiana is kind of notorious for that, you know, getting hurt, hit by hurricanes, uh, et cetera. So uh, anyway, um, uh, today, like I said, in today's lecture, I'm going to mostly talk about the Old Kingdom. Uh, which, you know, was famous for building a lot of these huge tombs, you know, to bury their their pharaohs, uh, often called the so-called Age of Pyramids. We'll get into that. I'll talk mostly about uh, mostly the third and fourth dynasties, which were really the most famous uh, overall. Uh, they had they had other dynasties, too. But that was the, the two that were the biggest uh, overall. Now, I will have some time probably today for a few minutes, and I'll kind of talk about the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. Uh, which, you know, played a major part uh, in why today in modern times they're able to understand and translate Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, so uh, if you have a comment, you know, question about this lecture, you know, you know, please let me know either during the live broadcast or, of course, later you can, you know, leave me comments, questions on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you have a question about the class, you know, please let me know uh, via email, which most of my students, of course, have that email address. Uh, if you, of course, watch it on YouTube uh, live, you can also join me in StreamYard.com. Uh, of course, here's the playlist, of course, uh, for, uh, of course, History 11, 13 lectures for the fall semester. So anyway, I hope you all are having a great afternoon at, out there uh, overall. Uh, so um, anyway, um, of course, we're going to continue talking about ancient Egypt, you know, part two. Uh, and, um, yeah, of course, uh, Old Kingdom, you know, like I said, was was often called the so-called Age of Pyramids, uh, which, you know, uh, obviously it's a modern name if historians or Egyptologists called ancient Egypt uh, later on. And those are the basic dynasties that were part of it. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth dynasties uh, were part of the Old Kingdom. This kind of happens right after the pre-dynastic period that King Narmer or Menes had started uh, back in the close to, I guess, back to the 32nd century uh, BC. Uh, sometimes they include the seventh and eighth uh, dynasties as well, but those are the majority of the main ones that usually, of course, are included with the old kingdom. It's one of the three major kingdoms I told you about uh, in ancient Egypt uh, that they had. If you go back up here, I think I mentioned this before uh, about the old about the old kingdom, they had all these other other kingdoms that they had too, uh, as well. 
uh, such as, of course, the old kingdom, uh, remember correctly, the middle kingdom, and of course, the new kingdom uh, also as well. So we're kind of talking about the first one. You can see the old kingdom lasted from roughly around the 26th century BC, uh, and it went down to about the 22nd century. So kind of a period of like basically 400 something years uh, that you're looking at. And that's when the pharaohs really become a centralized power as an empire, uh, mostly based around Egypt. They're, of course, known for their massive tombs they would build on ancient Egypt, which, of course, became known as the so-called pyramids. And uh, anyway, um, we're going to first talk about, you know, about about the old kingdom uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, in ancient Egypt, if you know much about the Egyptians, uh, they were famous for building these uh, cities of the dead, often called like necropolis sites. And the Egyptians would often bury well, there are people, you know, separate from where the cities of the living are. Who wants to be, you know, living in, a, I guess, a cemetery or whatever. But a lot, a lot of these were built to, to bury like the pharaohs, uh, nobility, uh, and other people. Uh, and most of these, by the way, were built on the West Bank uh, in, in, um, in ancient Egypt. Uh, and, um, of course, the reason for that uh, was because the Egyptians had a lot of um, theological beliefs about where the where the souls of the dead went, uh, and the belief was that it was like the god Ra, you know, the sun, sun god. Well, they believed that the god Ra traveled through the underworld, uh, going from the east to the west, you know, through the sky, and then travel through the underworld, and then rise up again in the east. So they all thought that where the sun went down, uh, that's where all the you know the dead went to. Oh, it looks like Jennifer's joining us afternoon. Hope you're having a great time out there, uh, Jennifer. It's glad glad for you to join us, of course. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much the theory on why they would build most of the necropolis sites, of course, in the West Bank. Uh, these are all examples of various necropolis sites where they build various tombs or pyramids uh, throughout Egypt. Abydos was believed to be one of the earliest uh, necropolis sites that went back to the time of King Menes or Narmer. Uh, which is kind of south of Cairo. Uh, Saqqara, outside of ancient Memphis, uh, also as well. That's where they built some of the first pyramids uh, in Egypt. Uh, Midam and Dashur uh, are kind of located south of Cairo, uh, south of the Delta. Uh, those are two necropolis sites, uh, of course, which were famous for various pyramids that were built there. Of course, Dashur is famous for the Red Pyramid. Uh, Giza, of course, the Giza Plateau with, you know, the Giza Complex, which is known for the so-called, you know, Giza Pyramids, of course, which we've kind of shown you already. Um, that's, of course, the most famous one built by the Fourth Dynasty, like King Khufu or Cheops. Uh, Valley of the Kings is also a necropolis site, which was built later under the, under the uh, New Kingdom. Uh, that was built in the uh, upper part of Egypt uh, by some of the pharaohs, like in the 18th Dynasty, etc., and that, that, that was a series of tombs that were that were built into the bedrock of mountains using like rock cut tombs like King Tut's tomb and all that. Uh, but that's a form of a necropolis area, you know, that they buried their dead in, uh, et cetera. Now, I'm going to first talk about examples of various, you know, tombs that were, you know, in ancient Egypt. One of the ones that they usually talk about the first that you may have heard about is the so-called mastaba, sometimes called a mastaba uh, also as well. Either way, it's an Arabic term uh, that's been around for years. Uh, these were some early first tombs of Egypt that were used that were mud brick in design. Uh, they went back to the pre-dynastic period, going, going to like, you know, King King Narmer Menes. Uh, and so these were used throughout Egypt, even up to like the old, I think, and even in the New Kingdom, they use these various types of tombs uh, throughout Egypt. And uh, there's different translations of the name. Uh, the Arabs called it Mastaba, which meant, I think, bench or stone bench. Some people say mud bench also as a translation of it because uh, they were made of mud brick. And then the uh, Egyptians called it uh, Perzit, which meant the house of eternity because uh, they believed that was where the soul of the deceased, their, their mummy was kept uh, so that they could live on in the afterlife. Uh, and so uh, that's the hieroglyphic variation of the name. And uh, that's kind of an image showing you what, I guess, the design of or outline of what a 
Mazda Pot look like. You can see they build this mud brick structure uh, over the tomb uh, with the shaft going down. And there you had the chamber that was, you know, you can see that was below the earth. And so they would store in there the mummy and whatever stores that they would need uh, for the afterlife uh, with most of these type, type you know, tombs that were constructed. Uh, and uh, I think also they would put like chambers in it like this, which might be like a mortuary chamber uh, where they could come in and bring the body and mummify them uh, on spot. Uh, so, so that's the earliest type of uh, tombs that were built. Uh, and, um, you know, stone bench is using the translation that's preferred. Uh, here's examples of mastabas, of course, that were built uh, in ancient Egypt. This is the third dynasty version, uh, which is usually called mastaba number 17. Uh, you can see that was kind of a large size mastaba, maybe one of the largest uh, ever constructed in ancient Egypt. And you can see how the pyramid design came about. You can see it's almost like an evolution where, you know, the, the, the so-called mastaba is almost like the bottom of a pyramid. Uh, where they're going to eventually start stacking up stone, you know, over time. Uh, these early structures were made of mud brick. They weren't built very well. Uh, as you know, a lot of them fell apart. Uh, some, of course, have been rebuilt and all this. And you got to wonder if that's maybe where the Sumerians got some of their influences uh, for building their you know, ziggurats later, which were also built of mud brick. Uh, but later structures are, are going to be built of stone uh, instead. Here's another one right here I'll show you too, which is a smaller one that's been, I think that one's been rebuilt. Uh, the bench of the Pharaoh at Dashur. Of course, you've seen that from the fourth dynasty. So some of these were obviously a lot smaller, and uh, some of them are made of stone later, uh, also as well. So there's different kinds of you know types of these tombs that are being constructed, but a lot of these tombs went back as far uh, as um, King Narmer, King Menes. They were, they were building these kinds of tombs uh, going back to the pre-dynastic period uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, then the other thing that happened, too, uh, with the, you know, um, I guess the so-called tomb designs of, of ancient Egypt, uh, they have, of course, another king come in uh, whose name is King Zoser. King Zoser is also called Netzerkit, uh, who they think was possibly the second king of the third dynasty who reigned in the 27th century. You can see the dates of his uh, reign, 2667 to about 2648 B.C., uh, and here's a better picture of him with his famous pyramid, often called the Pyramid of Zoser, uh, that you have here. And, uh, yeah, the Pyramid of Zoser is considered to be, you know, one of the first of these step pyramids that the Third Dynasty uh, began, to, you know, designing uh, in ancient Egypt, kind of evolving, you know, away from the Mastaba. So you can see, like, kind of like the bottom of his pyramid, you know, is almost kind of like the, you know, a Mastaba that we're kind of looking at uh, previously. Uh, and um, Zoser's uh, pyramid uh, was built at Saqqara. Saqqara is like a necropolis site that's kind of near Memphis in Cairo. Um, Saqqara is like kind of like the whole necropolis site of the whole third dynasty where they built several pyramids there, step pyramids. And so you can kind of see this type of pyramid structure is kind of like a, a step type design. You know, going up multiple, multiple uh, steps. Uh, kind of like a wedding cake, a, yeah, kind of like a wedding cake going up in kind of a rectangular shape, um, like on the bottom. It's not a perfectly square type, you know, pyramids that you have, of course, later. And uh, they believe this pyramid was designed by this uh, chancellor that was under him named Imhotep uh, that you may have heard of. Uh, he was like this priest that was a kind of a polymath. He was a genius. Uh, he was an engineer. He was a doctor. Um, and um, he actually designed it uh, as a six-step six, a six pyramid. Uh, and um, I've got other pictures, I guess, I guess showing the design of his pyramid, which is right here. It is considered, by the way, to be one of the first stone buildings uh, ever erected in the world. Uh, so you can see it's over, I guess it's always getting close to 4,500 to 5,000 years old. It's a pretty, pretty old building at this point. 
And uh, they do think it was probably designed from a mastaba. I think I think initially they were going to build a mastaba, and then Zoser kind of, I guess, talked him into building this huge pyramid structure. And uh, the dimensions of it, they think, uh, are about 203 feet tall. At least that's what they estimate how tall it was initially. But you can see it had a rectangular base to it, 358 uh, by 410 feet. Uh, so not, not exactly perfectly square. Uh, like your later pyramids, of course, are designed. You can see the bottom of it's kind of falling apart. You know, which you'll probably, probably, I think they're trying to re. I think they're trying to kind of rebuild it right now. I know it's ancient Egypt, uh, et cetera. But that's the kind of you know pyramid that they initially built, uh, and then over time they're going to eventually evolve into developing more smooth-sided pyramids, uh, like they talked about in that short video at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, here's kind of an image of what, how, I guess, the pyramid came about. Uh, they do think that basically it may have started out as a mastaba, and then basically they stacked up, you know, stone uh, is what they did. And you can see actually the barrel chamber was put underground, uh, where a lot of early pyramids were designed like that, where they were basically the actual barrel chamber was underground, and then later later pyramids will start putting the barrel chambers uh, inside the actual pyramid itself. So yeah, that, that happened under King Zoser, of course. Um, and then they had, of course, later pyramids that would be built uh, that become even famous after that. Uh, they have like several pyramids that were built under a king named King Snafru or Snafru. You could say it either way. Uh, so you get the so-called fourth dynasty starts developing these smooth-sided pyramids, or I think some people call it a true pyramid uh, is another another term that they use. And they start removing the steps from it. So it's not a step pyramid anymore. Uh, they kind of smooth the sides on them. Uh, like you saw, they use those white limestone, uh, you know, types of stone stone facings that, that kind of give it a smooth shape to it. And... Um, Snafru may have been involved in multiple pyramids. Uh, they think he was definitely involved in building the Bent Pyramid uh, and the Red Pyramid. Uh, they think he may have built another pyramid called the Midam Pyramid, but that's kind of debated about whether he built it or maybe a king of the Third Dynasty uh, may have also constructed uh, as well. Uh, Snafru is, it, uh, goes by different names. He's also called the Greek name Soros. Uh, and um, you know about Sneferu, he was the father of King Khufu. So he heavily influenced King Khufu or Cheops, who later built the Great Pyramid. Uh, and so Sneferu is definitely one of those kings that kind of influenced a lot of other rulers to uh, build, you know, bigger and better uh, pyramids uh, in the future. Uh, the ones we're going to talk about, uh, which, of course, are the red uh, in the bent pyramids, those two, those were actually built about 25 miles to the south of Cairo uh, at a site called Dashur. Uh, it's kind of a necropolis site that's known for various pyramids uh, that were constructed there around that time. Uh, I do got a bunch of pictures kind of showing or depicting some of these pyramids, of course, that are famous in Egypt. Uh, one of them, of course, here uh, is the so-called well-known bent pyramid uh, in Egypt. Uh, and um, the Bent Pyramid was considered to be one of the first smooth-sided pyramids that was completed. Uh, and, of course, as you know, it's known for its bent shape, uh, why, of course, it gets its name uh, today. Uh, I think I've got kind of an image here showing that one and then another one showing kind of like the, the up-close, you know, version of the actual white limestone casing that kind of gives it that smooth appearance that they're talking about. Uh, and um, it's also called the South Pyramid uh, because it's located south of the Red Pyramid, which is the other one I'll kind of get to uh, later. It was built with kind of a weird design. You can see it was built with two angles of inclination on the slope of the pyramid. The lower, the lower angle of the pyramid was about at a 50, 54 degree angle. Uh, and then the upper one is about 43 degrees. So you go back here, you can kind of see how abrupt the angles are uh, in differences between the two. Uh, and so it kind of gives it kind of a bent shape to it. 
Uh, but you, you can't you can kind of notice at the top of the pyramid uh, where it kind of goes up at a 43 degree 43 degree angle you can kind of start seeing how the pyramids uh, will be shaped later so that's exactly kind of how the pyramids will look uh, over time and so that design is kind of copied later into other pyramids like the red pyramid and of course the pyramid of khufu etc the great pyramid uh, etc so the bent pyramid was like the first experiment, you know, uh, with really these kind of smooth sided type true pyramid. But that one is tomb. Uh, he decided, of course, to not be buried in it uh, with that one. Right. Then, of course, the one that they always talk about, which obviously was the one that eventually, you know, Snefru was buried in. That one, of course, is the so-called Red Pyramid, uh, which the Red Pyramid is also called the North Pyramid. It's also called the Bat Pyramid, uh, not because Batman lives in it or whatever, but uh, it is notorious for having a lot of bats that live inside of it. Uh, of course, you can go in a lot of these pyramids still uh, in modern Egypt today. Uh, this particular pyramid was, uh, of course, considered to be one of the first, you know, successful, you know, smooth-sided pyramid uh, that was actually built uh, in it was built, by the way, to a height of about 345 feet tall. So it actually, at one point, was the tallest structure in the world uh, when it was built. Uh, it's now, by the way, the third tallest uh, pyramid uh, after uh, the Khufu's Great Pyramid and also the Pyramid of Khafre, uh, both near Cairo. You can see it's also about 720 feet on each side, so pretty equal. Uh, which a lot of these pyramids were, like I said, a perfect square base uh, on the bottom of them. Uh, and uh, so so that particular pyramid, you know, was became very, very famous. And uh, why was it called the Red Pyramid? Uh, well, it was constructed with local reddish limestone uh, instead of, uh, I guess, limestone coming from like, I think usually if you study about ancient Egypt, uh, they had this uh, famous quarry called Tura, where they got a lot of their limestone from. Well, this was gotten from a local quarry where it, apparently it had like something like uh, iron ore in it. And so it kind of gave this reddish color to it. But what happened was they stripped off all of the white limestone facings from it, like they talked about in that video. And so that's what it looks like today. So, and it was one of the first pyramids to have like a, the tomb actually built into it. Like the barrel chamber was actually uh, built actually in, inside of it. Uh, to bury Snefru. Uh, a lot of pyramids also, if you study about, they would often put these uh, pyramidians on the top, a little capstone, I guess they called it uh, as well. So a lot of these were often made of like, like a type of granite. Uh, and uh, there's a theory that like all the pyramids were, were white because uh, how, how they, uh, supposedly after they built the pyramids or when they you know, would design them, they would take sand and they would sand down the, the white limestone, you know, it gives this white polished look that uh, they talked about uh, in the video. And I think some historians even claim that the actual capstone was engraved in gold, like with a gold top with the white looking, you know, pyramid uh, with it. So that's the theory about how, you know, that would come about. And you also see this on obelisks, the top of an obelisk also has a pyramidion on it too uh, as well. Right. Then you got, of course, the, the famous pyramid, you know, that is, you know, the, one of the most well known in the world, which is, of course, is the famous Great Pyramid. Uh, and um, the Great Pyramid, if you know about this, was built by this king named King Khufu we were talking about, or Cheops, uh, who, like I said, was the son of, of King Sneferu. Uh, he was um, the second ruler after Sneferu of the Fourth Dynasty. And he built this huge uh, burial complex outside of Cairo today, which is now called the Giza Complex, or Giza, I guess the Giza Plateau. It's called different names that they call it today. I think if you look at here with this uh, image, you can see that um, it was a huge complex uh, where they would build all these uh, different tombs with the Great Pyramid. So it wasn't just his pyramid, the Pyramid of Khufu, as they call it also, but it included also uh, the Pyramid of Khafre, his son, right here, and also the Pyramid of Minkari, who was a 
a grandson of Khufu uh, as well. Uh, you can see the Sphinx is also over here, which is very famous with the Giza complex as well. So you can see there's a massive burial complex uh, that was constructed uh, right here. Uh, and, um, of course, these are the actual pyramids themselves today, the Giza pyramids. Uh, so you can see here uh, the Great Pyramid is right. Actually, that's the Great Pyramid right here. Uh, pyramid of Khafre, the middle. That's the Pyramid of Menkari, which is actually a lot smaller than that picture. These are kind of like, looks like the Queen's Pyramids, which are kind of like in the front uh, that you're looking at uh, also as well. Now, if we go back to, uh, of course, the, period, the picture of, of the Great Pyramid of Giza, uh, and um, this particular pyramid, if you study about it, was the largest pyramid ever built uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, more taller than any other pyramid, not just here, but in the world. You know, in Mesoamerica, they have pyramids that were also built, like the Pyramid of the Sun, you hear about that one, it was probably one of the largest built in the Americas, and all that. Uh, and um, the stats on the pyramid uh, right here uh, you can see the pyramid was built uh, to a height of about, I don't know where it is right here somewhere, but it was built to a height of about 480 feet tall. There it is right there, 480 feet tall. Uh, so constructed in the 26th century uh, BC, yeah, 480 feet tall. Uh, and uh, at least that's the estimate height of the original height, either 480 or 481, I think is the range uh, usually of the original height of it. Each side, by the way, is about 756 feet, uh, which would be about 13 acres, the amount of land that it takes up. Well, you can see the Great Pyramid here with the, some of the Queen's Pyramids. That's also supposed to be Khufu's famous boat that they've reconstructed, uh, which is right here as well. You know, see another picture, of course, right here. Probably a better picture, of course, Cairo with the Great Pyramid. Uh, right there. Uh, and um, it was part of a huge, like I said, part of this huge burial complex that was built by Khufu's, you know, uh, family that's, that's right there. And so, yeah, you, these are all the things that are pretty much there. You can see you've got the, the Pyramid of Giza, uh, you got the Pyramid of Khafre, Pyramid of Menkari, uh, the Great Sphinx, uh, the Queen's Pyramids, but they have a lot of other tombs too that are there uh, also as well. Uh, tombs for a lot of nobility, uh, tombs for various workers uh, that worked on the tombs, uh, etc. Uh, so there's all kinds of tombs that are basically available that were there that were built later. Those actual statistics on the actual pyramids, uh, if you want, but pretty much the height now is not 480 anymore. Uh, it's of course because they stripped the top of it off, and a lot of the, you know, the white limestone facings have been stripped as well. Uh, I think the height now today. Uh, is believed to be like 456 feet or something like that in that range. So a lot of it's been stripped off uh, from a long time ago. Uh, it is the only, by the way, remaining seven wonder of the world, according to the ancient Greeks. Uh, so for 3,800 years, it's pretty amazing, it was the tallest man-made structure in the world. Uh, wow. And I think after that, they built some other structures like the Eiffel Tower and others, I guess, in Europe, all well, that probably get taller than that. Uh, but that's that's pretty amazing. Almost four thousand years. It's the tallest structure, you know, in the world. And all the other seven wonders have, have pretty have pretty much collapsed, except for except for that one. It was, by the way, the first one built of the seven wonders uh, as well. Uh, by Napoleon's time, I think they say scientists uh, by the early eighteen hundreds. Well, I figured out that the Great Pyramid was constructed with something like 2.3 million stone blocks, uh, which is equivalent to, by the way, 5. million tons of stone, if you kind of put that together uh, as a whole. Well, the average weight of the, of the stone blocks vary, I believe. I think it's like anywhere from like two to six tons. Uh, but some think there's some that are heavier than that, which are on the bottom. Uh, but the higher you go up, the lighter the, the tonnage gets, uh, which may have made it easier, you know, when, when they built the top of the pyramid. Uh, there's countless theories on how the pyramids were built. You know, the oldest theory, you know, they have about the, you know, the pyramids is Herodotus, you know, in his histories of Herodotus in book two, uh, writing back in the fifth century. And Herodotus had all kinds of theories about how it was built 
Uh, he believed they used slave labor originally uh, to construct construct the pyramid. I thought he said something like 100,000 workers were involved in, I think, the building of the pyramid or something like that. Uh, but they now think it's like skilled labor that was involved in the building the pyramids. Uh, they didn't have draft animals. They had to use brute human force uh, to move a lot of these stones into place. You saw in the video that they, the main theory of how they constructed it uh, was they used some kind of ramping system, uh, probably using like mud brick type ramps uh, to build build up to it and then use human brute force to, to move the blocks into place. But obviously it took skill uh, to cut a lot of these blocks or uh, to sand down the, the white limestone facing uh, in general. Uh, but I can't imagine, I think they have found some, uh, some of the tombs of some of the workers that work there. And some of the work was, you know, literally backbreaking because uh, these things were so, so heavy uh, moving into place. Uh, if you look at um, this uh, image right here, it shows like the, the different uh, chambers that were in the tomb, which that's one thing that's famous about uh, the Great Pyramid. It is known for having multiple chambers in it. Uh, most other of these pyramids like at Giza don't have that. They usually have like one barrel chamber uh, inside of it, but apparently this one has about several uh, that are in it. And uh, you can see like on the bottom here, there was one that they call the so-called uh, false tomb chamber, it's called. And there's a theory that it was built there to um, fool tomb robbers. I think that's where the tomb, uh, the chamber is. Uh, but obviously that didn't fool them and they eventually broke into it anyway. Uh, and so that wasn't used, they think, for the actual uh, tomb chamber of, you know, King Khufu. Uh, there's another one called the Queen's Chamber, which they believe the Arabs kind of nicknamed it later. And they took over Egypt. And uh, there was a theory that it may have been used to bury one of his wives there, but they don't think so. Uh, they think it may have been used to maybe put a statue of Khufu in there, which represented his soul. Uh, but they're not sure about what it was used for. Uh, there's also this grand gallery that runs up uh, to where the, the main chamber Oh, the king of Khufu is right here. And uh, the Egyptians put uh, a lot of stone blocks to block it, to prevent people from getting into the chamber. But people still got in it in ancient times. They robbed it. Uh, they also put these relieving blocks uh, above the chamber uh, to prevent the actual pyramid from collapsing down on the barrel chamber. Uh, interesting about that. Uh, some of those blocks above it are very heavy as well, along with the ones that block the chamber for people getting in. Uh, there's also some strange things about uh, Khufu's Great Pyramid. They put these air shafts in here, if you know about that. Uh, there's been theories about why they put that in that, the ancient Egyptians, but there's one theory that they believe they put that there to allow Khufu's soul to leave the actual pyramid and go to the underworld. Uh, they have sent robots into some of these like air shafts. And I think recently, a few years ago, they actually found a new chamber uh, inside uh, the actual pyramid. They drilled into it. They actually found this, um, they found this one chamber had like a door with handles on it. They drilled into it. They didn't find anything in it. Uh, so there may be other chambers inside the pyramid, uh, but what's in there, they don't know. It's kind of a mystery. Uh, and uh, I guess they'd have to take apart the whole thing. You know, to find out what's in it besides those chambers, which if there are any. All right, so uh, I'm going to also move on. So, you know, kind of talking about, you know, Khufu's, you know, Great Pyramid. Uh, there's also this other pyramid I did want to talk about, uh, which is well known uh, in, in Egypt today. Uh, here's, by the way, uh, I didn't show you, but here's the actual empty, I guess, sarcophagus of Khufu, like where he was actually buried uh, in the actual uh Great Pyramid, you can see pretty much robbed. And uh, one thing that's really weird about the early pyramids, there's no writing on the walls. They find graffiti later for people that break into it later or go into it later, uh, like tourists, I guess. But um, they don't really start writing on the walls until the fifth dynasty. Yeah, the so-called pyramid texts that they have later and all that. But they did find a, a graffiti at the top of the chamber 
or some worker they think wrote the word Khufu in it. It's, that's why they think that it was his, you know, his actual pyramid of Khufu. And of course, Harada says it was too, like in his ancient writings, uh, talking about Khufu. And I'll talk about what he thought about Khufu uh, as well. So yeah, here's the um, other pyramid that's, of course, well known, uh, which is, um, here's a better picture right here, the Pyramid of Khafre, uh, which you can see. Uh, and uh, Khafre, Khafre's Pyramid uh, is the second tallest pyramid that was constructed after, of course, King Khufu's Great Pyramid, uh, built right after his father's. Uh, there's even a theory that Khafre finished Khufu's Pyramid. Uh, before he actually had to build his, because uh, it was taking too long. Uh, I think Harada said these pyramids took uh, something like 20, 25 years for them to be constructed, uh, roughly, these huge ones like this. And uh, his pyramid was um, built to a height, of, I think, originally about 471 feet tall. Uh, and the size of it, I guess the uh, actual, you know, each, four, each of the sides are about 706 feet each. Uh, so to kind of give you an idea, so... They're comparable, similar to each other in size. They always look, in fact, actually, Khafre's looks bigger because uh, it's kind of on a plateau a little bit uh, compared to Khufu's Great Pyramid. But uh, they do think that originally the Great Pyramid's taller uh, than Khafre's. Uh, they do think it was robbed in ancient times. And uh, there was a man named Giovanni Belzoni in 1818 uh, was one of the first in modern times to actually explore it. Uh, they think that one was robbed uh, also uh, in H8, also in you know, ancient times uh, as well. So none of their mummies or any riches that were, I guess, were in the pyramid uh, basically exist. So it was pretty much robbed uh, as a whole. It's not as complex. That's one of the weird things about it uh, that's interesting about that. But uh, one thing that is very famous about, you know, Khafre's Pyramid uh, is that it's got this huge burial complex uh, that's part of it uh, that includes the so-called Sphinx, uh, which I'll, of course, uh, be talking about uh, at, as well. Uh, Khafre, of course, was the son of Khufu, of course, you can see there. And um, it's famous for the Sphinx, which is part of a temple complex that kind of runs from a causeway uh, that goes from what is uh, Khafre's Pyramid to a temple complex there where that where the Statue of the Sphinx is today. Uh, and um, Sphinx is this uh, royal statue uh, that was built there, uh, which they think represented one of the pharaohs, which I think now Egyptologists and historians think it's actually represented, they think, King Khufu, uh, who I guess designed and built this whole complex, this barrel complex, uh, now near Cairo now today. And um, here's the dimensions of it. It was built basically about 240 feet long was the original length of the actual uh, Sphinx statue. Um, also, also um, the actual design, um, the typo with that Sphinx, I just noticed with that, but the actual design of uh, the actual um Sphinx itself. Here's a better picture, kind of an angle of the Sphinx, uh, which is right here, showing the length of it, left to right, uh, you're looking at. But um, so 240 feet, and you can see 66 feet high, of course, from the top to the bottom. Uh, and then, of course, the width of it is about 62 feet also as well. So it is one of the oldest monumental statues in ancient Egypt. You know, Sphinx was this mythical type creature uh, that was, you know, part lion, part man, you know, the head of a, supposed to be the head of the, the, the head of a human, like, which is the king. Uh, and um, there's all kinds of theories on who built it. I think there's, there's the main theory I know, uh, at least that's popular today, was that King Khafre, uh built it um, to honor his father. And of course, the face of it, a lot of, a lot of historians and Egyptologists think that the face on the actual Sphinx is King Khufu or Cheops, you know, the man that built the uh, Great Great Pyramid. Uh, and, um, and of course, the reason why they pick, you know, a lion is because a lion represents, you know, the power of the king. You know, lions are ferocious, uh, etc. Uh, and so you can understand why, you know, 
that would be chosen as actually the you know the actual symbol of it. But um, yeah, the Sphinx uh, it's famous for a lot of things. Uh, for, you know, back in ancient times, uh, it was often you know buried, you know, uh, multiple times. Uh, I think the ancient Greeks at one point thought it was a statue standing up and didn't really have a body to it. I do know under the new kingdom, there was a king named King Tutmos IV who supposedly had it unburied and later put the so-called dream stele in, in front of it because uh, it was this kind of omen that, that basically or prophecy that whoever unburied the actual Sphinx would become Pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, a long time ago, like going back to I know medieval times, a lot of people would call it the father of terror or terrors uh, because uh, they believed it was um, the statue uh, that was watching over everything. Not just the, I guess the complex, but but people. I think no matter where you stood, like near the Sphinx, it looked like it was staring at you, uh, which is kind of weird the way it was designed. Uh, and, um, of course, in a lot of images, you know, the Sphinx doesn't have a nose. Uh, of course, I know for a long time it was believed that Napoleon's forces, some of his troops had shot the nose off. They don't think that's true. Uh, they think it actually was done probably probably by Muslim forces that took over Egypt a long time ago, and they actually shot the nose off. And I think part of the nose is in the Egyptian Museum in, in, in Cairo today. They still have part of it. So I did have a nose at one point, uh, but it doesn't anymore. So that's kind of the so-called Sphinx uh, that you're looking at. It's called Sphinx or Great Sphinx. It's called different names, of course, but usually just Sphinx for, for short, uh, pretty much. Uh, there's another, of course, uh, famous, of course, pyramid that was also built at the site as well by Minkari. Minkari was another pharaoh who, of course, was the son of Khafre, basically a grandson of Khufu or Cheops. It's also called Mykeranos. Uh, he built the third Giza pyramid there. The th three of the largest, you know, three of the largest ones there, the third largest. And um, anyway, um, that was built more down to the end of the 26th century BC. It's hard to tell of that particular picture, but it's not a very large pyramid. Uh, as I say, the third tallest of the three Giza pyramids was only built to a height of 215 feet tall. You know, like, wow, you know, compared to some of the other ones, which are, you know, double that or more. See, the width is about 339 feet on each side. So obviously it's a much smaller size area that it was built on. And uh, of course, there's all kinds of theories about, you know, why Minkari, you know, built, you know, such a small pyramid. Uh, I think Herodotus had his own theories, you know, and why, you know, Minkari built, you know, to such a small pyramid. Uh, and uh, his theory was that King Khufu and Khafre were these tyrannical pharaohs that made all their people, you know, build these huge pyramid structure tombs as slaves. Uh, and so he believed that Minkari was benevolent, like a nicer ruler, didn't want to spend all this money building such a huge tomb. So he built a smaller one. Because uh, if you look at this, uh, he, um, here's the dates for when he reigned. You can see he reigned a little longer, I think, than some of the other pharaohs before. Uh, he could have built a large pyramid. Obviously, he was in power almost 30 years. He could have easily built a huge one uh, as well, uh, but it was built smaller. Uh, of course, there is another theory, too, that uh, Minkari built a smaller pyramid because of the fact that these huge pyramids before, like Great Pyramid and uh, Capri's pyramid were bankrupting the country, all this money they were spending on it. And so he built a smaller one. I think that's the main reason why they think it happened, really. Uh, they do have some other pyramids, which are nearby uh, as well, which are called the Queen's Pyramids. These are right next to the Great Pyramid of, of Giza. Uh, these are actually pyramids that were designed uh, to be buried as tombs uh, for Khufu's wives. There's one for his mother. Uh, as well. Uh, here's some other ones right here. Here's one, of course, the one that's the most famous one, the Pyramid of Hedaferis, uh, sometimes called Hedaferis I, uh, at, at the Great Pyramid. Uh, and that one's the best one. Uh, I think that still is from, from you know, that time period.
So obviously, you know, like there weren't any women that were buried in the tomb with him. Well, like the so-called Queen's Pyramids, like the Queen, the Queen's Chamber that we talked about before. Uh, so it's obviously that these were built separately, you know, as tombs for his like wives or his mother as well. I think the one for his mother is the one you're looking at, which is right here. Uh, there's also this boat, if you know about this, that they've reconstructed uh, and also next to the Great Pyramid. And that's actually this boat of Khufu uh, that they built for him. Because uh, it's really weird, but the Egyptians thought they, they would need things like boats in the afterlife, uh, etc. They put all kinds of things in the barrel chamber that they would need the next life or next world. And so I guess he had had that had to have that for his celestial voyage, you know, to you know the, the next world and all that. But it's been rebuilt. They put it kind of in this museum that's right next to the Great Pyramid uh, today. Uh, so that's kind of kind of neat about this. And a lot of these boats were, I think, were built from like things like wood and papyrus. Pretty amazing. All right, I'm also going to talk about today, the other thing I need to get into and discuss uh, is about the um, so-called Rosetta Stone uh, that they have uh, that becomes famous uh, in, in ancient Egypt. And that's something that's real well known. You've probably heard of, of course, today. And uh, Rosetta Stone uh, is uh, very important because it would eventually lead into the discovery, the modern discoveries, of course, of the Egyptian language system and all that. I think I kind of exchange, I kind of talked about this before, but um, the Egyptian language was considered like a type of Afro-Asiatic language that's spoken in North Africa. I guess they kind of call it the Himito-Semitic type languages uh, that we talked about before. And it's very similar to like the Berber Semitic languages uh, that are kind of uh, famous uh, in the region. And um, the kind of language they used uh, was a type of logographic type syllabic, but also alphabetic, which it was, by the way, it was an alphabet. Uh, but the elements of it were very complicated. Some of the symbols could be as many from, I guess, on the time period of when it is, anywhere from 500 to 3,000 type of symbols uh, that was used. And there's different types. I'll get to later. There's, you know, they got cursive forms of hieroglyphics uh, that were also used later. Uh, as well. But they think the Greeks were the ones that coined the term uh, hieroglyph or hieroglyphic uh, being used. Usually hieroglyphs is the correct term. It comes from two words, hiero, meaning either sacred or priestly uh, in Greek, and then glyph, uh, which means either carving or writing. Uh, they call it that because basically back in Greek Roman times, Greco Roman times, most of the people that could read it were the priestly class that went back to, I guess, the cults of ancient Egypt, Amun Ra, the uh, cult of Amun Ra, etc. And um, so that's where the name came from. And of course, they called it, you know, carving or writing because it was written on stone, written on, you know, papyrus, you know, that hedge plant I told you about, they made into paper. And so hence the name being used. Uh, what was the name they used? They don't know. I don't know if they really know what, what they called actual language, but mostly it was the educated classes that knew how to really write in a lot of these languages. Later, they had cursive forms, hieratic, demotic. Those are cursive forms of hieroglyph uh, that were later you know, used to write on papyrus, like using like ink, uh, which they created in also Egypt. Uh, and so they had that uh, also as well. Uh, they also had like Coptic later. I don't know if you heard of Coptic, but Coptic's like a form of like um, hieroglyphics using Greek, uh, which will be popular uh, in Egypt in, in ancient times and into the Middle Ages. Uh, they have that later as well, which will kind of be a key, by the way, uh, into translating uh, hieroglyphics. It's used a lot. The Coptic language is used a lot by the Coptic Christians or Coptic Church uh, in Egypt today. Uh, now, what happened, though, was like during the Middle Ages, the what happened was the language was lost. So nobody could read it anymore. Uh, the Romans became Christian. Uh, they they thought, you know, the pagan cults of ancient Egypt had to be banned and all that. And so a lot of the priests that could actually read 
the actual you know language, etc., were all killed uh, or they died off. And so other alphabets came in that were phonetic type, like you know Arabic, Greek, Latin, etc. That that replaced basically hieroglyphs as the language, and so it was all lost as an actual language. Now what happened though was uh, there was this man you probably heard of named Napoleon who came in. And you probably heard of Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, and uh, Napoleon. Um, famous general of France, you know, in the 18th, 19th, 18th, 19th century, who would later go on to become emperor of France, as you know, would invade Egypt. Uh, and the French and like a lot of people in Europe were very interested in ancient, ancient Egypt. They thought there was a lot of, in fact, Napoleon thought there was a lot of mysteries about ancient Egypt. Uh, they were kind of unknown that they could learn about, about their culture. and may put it towards, you know, modern Europe, et cetera. Uh, of course, he had that famous quote he said when he was fighting in Egypt against, I think, the Turks at the time, which was, soldiers, 40 centuries looked down upon you. Uh, because we can see the Sphinx there uh, with him. And uh, so, um, so, yeah, his forces came in. And so uh, they believe that Napoleon's invading armies uh, end up fighting, uh, finding this Rosetta Stone, uh, which was found, by the way, it was found in the Delta region of the Nile Basin. Uh, this man named uh, Pierre-Francois Bouchard, who was a French soldier, I believe he was an engineer, who was inspecting a fort, Fort Julian, uh, in, in the Delta, in a city called Rosetta, a little town there. Uh, and so um, apparently it was in a wall, this, this stone that you're looking at uh, in this picture uh, that I showed you a second ago. It's like a, a half ton stone, uh, and uh, it's like a black looking stone. They pulled it out of the wall, and they didn't know what it was. They had no idea, uh, basically. Uh, but what they find out later, when it's you know later translated, if you know about this, it's later some kind of stone from the Ptolemaic dynasty of ancient Egypt, which was founded by the Greeks after um, Alexander conquered Egypt. And uh, anyway, um, apparently it was some kind of inscription that was kind of discussing how King Ptolemy V was being crowned as the king of Ptolemaic Egypt, like the fifth king of that dynasty. He lived in the second century. And so one of the things that they did, which is very famous about the Rosetta Stone, if you know about it, they wrote the actual, actual inscription uh, in three different languages, uh, top part being hieroglyphs, middle part being demotic, and the bottom part was written in Greek. And um, later on, kind of important, they've got there, that little slide there, but um, Coptic does play a major role, which Coptic is later, like I said, a version of Greek that's got hieroglyphic influences in it. That's going to play a major role in why they were able to uh, translate. It's like a modified form of the Greek alphabet you know, using borrowed letters from actually Dabati, that, that type of uh, cursive type Egyptian script that I've talked about uh, a little little bit a little bit ago. Uh, and um and uh, there was this man, this Frenchman, by the way, uh his name is Jean Fran Jean Francois Champollion. He was able to get a copy of it of the Rosetta Stone. Uh, and if you know about it by the 1820s he was able to take this half ton stone uh, you know, this inscription on it uh, and translate it, and translate the actual hieroglyphs on it, which talked about King Ptolemy V. And so from there, we kind of understood afterwards how the language worked and we could then read uh, whatever kind of, you know, hieroglyphs that was in, you know, you know, modern Egypt today. Uh, Champollion, by the way, was one of the first to actually go to Egypt and start trying to read a lot of the hieroglyphs He's really considered to be one of the fathers of Egyptology because that's something that kind of starts happening, you know, after that, you know, in the, in the 19th century, you start getting all these ar archaeologists that go there. But, <laughs> you know, about it, there was also all these fortune hunters like Belzoni that went in there to try to go into all these tombs and so on. And, and a lot of stuff was stolen uh, by the European powers, you know, and brought back. Uh, you can see the, the British eventually got, a, got, got the Rosetta Stone. 
because uh, Napoleon's forces were actually defeated uh, in Egypt at one point. They got the Rosetta Stone, and now it's in the British Museum of London. Uh, and they don't want to give it back <laughs> either. It's kind of a controversy, uh, the Rosetta Stone, uh, you know, today. Uh, but that's kind of one of those things that, that kind of, because of, I guess, European history and uh, what happened in uh, modern time, early modern times uh, overall. So that's how the language kind of gets well known. I think the discovery of the Rosetta Stone and probably King Tut's tomb in the early 20th century uh, plays a major role uh, in why um, modern Egyptology kind of comes about later. Hey, Lashanta, uh, kind of late, kind of uh, putting that up there. But hey, hope you're having a great afternoon uh, also as well. So anyway, um, that's going to be my main lecture for today, part two, of course, on ancient Egypt. Uh, of course, sometime next week, uh, we'll have, of course, a third lecture, of course, on ancient Egypt, where I'm going to talk more about uh, into like the later New Kingdom uh, that comes in, which is really the empire building and peak phase, uh, really, of ancient Egypt, especially going down to the end of the Bronze Age. So I'll, I'll be talking about more of that uh, lately uh, in a few days, but I'm not sure when we'll have a lecture coming up. We're going to, of course, have to see how this tropical weather, you know, pans out, of course, in South Louisiana. Uh, we, of course, might have it postponed. We'll just have to check and see how things go, of course, with the weather uh, in general. So before I go, don't forget, uh, you have, of course, the prehistory uh, quiz uh, that's due. Uh, I think that's due tonight. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the ones that are, you know, now that we've talked about, which, you know, are coming up next week sometime. You've got, of course, the Mesopotamia quiz. Uh, you got to get that done next. And then you got the vocab coming up next week due uh, also as well. First, first key terms assignment. Uh, so that needs to be wrapped up, of course, uh, next week, uh, which the due dates for those, you know, like I said, might be pushed back. We'll have to see. Maybe the hurricane, of course, will move east or west from us and not affect us. At least I hope so anyway. So looks like there's no comments, questions today on the live stream. But yeah, uh, you know, anytime you want, you can leave comments, questions, of course, about this lecture. Just let me know uh, about that. Uh, and uh, if you had a comment, question, of course, about the class, you know, you can send me an email uh, about that anytime you want uh, overall. I hope you all have a good time, a good, good weekend coming up. Hopefully, you know, we don't get a storm here, but we'll see how that goes, of course. Um, you know, coming up at the end of the weekend. So y'all take care. Uh, and of course, uh, have, have a great weekend uh, coming up. So y'all take care.